you began your response by a, by a discourse on leadership and the role of the president. Okay. So I'd like to take a moment um, to go back in time, if we can. Uh, tonight is the 35th anniversary of the launching of the Yom Kippur War. Um, it is a moment when uh, we can recall the terrible con conflict in the Middle East, but also a moment that eventually set the stage for your diplomacy in helping pivot from war to peacemaking. So if you could take a moment and, and go back to that era, and if I ask you who from that era of Middle East leaders did you find the most impressive politically, diplomatically, who would that be and why? From Middle East leaders? Yes. Uh, I would say without any question, Sadat. Uh, we, uh, let me first of all explain our basic strategy. In 1969, when Nixon became president and I became security advisor, uh, we faced a situation in which no, none, none of the major countries in the region had any diplomatic relations with us. There was a, a, a war along the Suez Canal uh, that it was not a ground war, but it was Israeli retaliation against uh, uh, Egyptian uh, in, incursions. And uh, there were massive Soviet armed shipments into the region. We adopted a strategy which was to demonstrate to the Arab countries that they could get nowhere by Soviet arms and to make serious negotiations depend on separating, at least to a considerable extent, from the Soviet Union. And we maintained that position until the war broke, uh, until the war broke out. And, one, and in, I must say, uh, we did not take Sadat very seriously. I, for a while, I thought he was a character out of Aida, uh, who was uh, making terrible threats, which he never implemented. And uh, in fact, he sent an emissary once, uh, and we were talking at the end of his presentation. The emissary said, if you, if, if we make progress, the president will invite you to Cairo. And I wrote on a note to the person who was sitting next to me on the American side, I said, do you think it would be impolite if I asked him what the second prize is? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, so when, when the war started, uh, we decided that that was, in a way, the opportunity we had been looking for. We were absolutely determined to prevent any victory to be achieved by Soviet arms. But we also thought that having achieved this, we could use that demonstration to begin a peace process uh, with, uh, with the Arab side. And we sent a message to Sadat on the first day of the war saying, you're now making war with Soviet arms. But keep in mind that you have to make peace with American diplomacy. Now, whatever we did, the contribution of Sadat was that he understood that the question of peace with Israel was as, was, as much, was above all a psychological problem, that it was crucial for, the, for Israel to gain enough of a sense of security so that it could make the sacrifice that is inherent in giving up something permanent for something intangible, which is the essence of the peace process. 
which is the essence of the peace process. And at various stages uh, of, uh, of the negotiations afterwards, uh, he showed enough confidence in us. Uh, for example, some of you may remember that at the war ended with the Egyptian Third Army trapped by actions that had taken place after the siege fire uh, had been in effect. And so the big issue was uh, uh, how, uh, what, what could be the first step towards peace? And the first time I saw Sadat uh, at the, after the end of the war, I, he asked me, what is, your, what is your plan for making progress here? I said, you have two choices. You can insist on the road being opened and uh, we can probably get this. But then we will expend a lot of energy on something that does not affect the situation. Or we can take the time and develop a disengagement plan of withdrawal from the Suez Canal and establishing a demilitarized zone along it and to begin the process of uh, of territory for peace. But for that, you have to keep the army where it is and have it supplied through Israeli lines. Uh, so he said, I'll take the big solution, which meant that it uh, had to sit there another three months and that if the negotiations had failed, they would have been. So he made these decisions at every uh, step of the way. At the same time, let me say a word uh, about the Israelis. Uh, Golda Meir was, uh, looked like everybody's favorite ad, except when you wanted to take one inch of Israeli territory away from her. She was a very tough uh, negotiator, but one had to understand that a people that had suffered for every square mile of territory and that had no real margin of survival could not engage in experiments. So it was her obligation to conduct the peace process in a manner in which it was clear that these were painful decisions to be made. She could not afford the grand gestures that Sadat, with a huge territory, could afford to make. But to her enormous credit, while on every single issue, it was extremely complicated to negotiate, she went the route on both the Egyptian and Syrian negotiations that uh, led to, on the Egyptian side, to a peace process and on the Syrian side to a settlement that is still maintained today and that uh, I don't think has been significantly violated by the Syrians. And I think of Golda with enormous affection and enormous respect. <laughs>